Genres are alive. Like other living things, genres are created, they mature, they adapt, they age, and they die. Well, sort of. A dead genre is a misnomer. It might become rare and niche, but no genre is truly dead. They can split and shatter, and be remade and remixed into a dozen others. And they can be reborn, come back in vogue, and fade away again. I think there might be no genre with a more interesting history than the adventure game. It spawned 40 years ago as little more than text, adapted and changed with new hardware and new design sensibilities, became a juggernaut in the 90s, collapsed, and re-emerged to live again. And so, we're making a two-part series on the history and design of the adventure game. And today's video is the first half of this story, classic adventure games. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor, Skillshare. I'm a big fan of Skillshare. I've been using their courses for years now, and thanks to them, I've learned a ton and become much more efficient at editing videos. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on dozens of topics. They've got some great motion graphics courses full of techniques that I've been working into almost every episode of Design Doc. They've got great classes on video editing, graphic design, and animation, my favorites, but also photography, marketing, web development, and so many other subjects that you could use too. You can get access to everything with premium membership for just $10 a month, which is way cheaper and more convenient than in-person classes or workshops. You can try it out with a free two-month trial by signing up with our link below. The 1970s were a decade of discovery for video games. No gaming conventions had been established. Even the idea of telling a substantial story in a game was new. Will Crowther and Don Woods developed Colossal Cave Adventure, the first known example of interactive fiction, anywhere. You and I would immediately recognize it as a text adventure, but this was cutting-edge design in 1975. The game would unfold as a series of lines and paragraphs, and based on clues in the text, you type out what you wanted your character to do next. Go east. Pick up rock. For the time, it was amazing. It was like a book where you could choose your own direction, and where the story adapted to the circumstances that you had a part in creating. Well, as long as the text parser understood what you were typing. But in a world where your other gaming options were this, or this, literally any story that couldn't be summarized in 10 words was a killer app by itself. More developers made more text adventures over the next several years. Here's where Zork and Platfall get their start. Some developers also realized you could adapt existing license properties into the text adventure format really well. Popular books like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and The Hobbit got their own text adventures. The game slowly became more complex, longer, and better written, but home computing was opening new opportunities to tweak the format. Roberta Williams, founder of Sierra, had an idea. She thought the newer computers coming out in the early 80s with their slick, uh, having graphics, could help make the adventure genre way more popular. She wrote the script for Mystery House in three weeks and got her husband and Sierra co-founder, Ken Williams, to program the thing. It was the first adventure game with graphics, and was a surprise hit, selling tens of thousands of copies over mail order. It started Sierra's high-res game series, which would become their first success and establish them as major adventure game developers. Yep, this was so high-res in 1980 that they named their entire series High-Res. Sierra's games caught the eye of IBM in 1982. IBM was looking for a killer app for their new home computer, the PC Junior. It boasted 16 color graphics and a sound chip that sounded much better than the built-in PC speaker of the day. They asked Roberta and Ken to make something stunning for their new machine, a replayable, complex, and dynamic adventure game. Roberta took inspiration from folklore and fairy tales that she liked to read as a child, and developed the story for what became King's Quest. The game would be a full-screen, colorful, animated adventure, with lots of puzzles to solve in a modeled world the characters moved through instead of showing static scenes on screen. The characters could even move with the arrow keys, instead of going through the chore of typing out directions. IBM was sold, and 18 months later, the first King's Quest was released. The game was a critical success, but the PC Junior sold terribly, and sales of King's Quest were just as bad at launch. It was a big problem for computer game developers in the 80s, 
the home computer ecosystem was extremely fragmented, and software sold for each system was largely incompatible with other computers. If you wanted a true blockbuster game, you might have to port it to a half dozen systems, and you'd likely have to do it from scratch for each port. To help speed things along, Sierra was also developing their own adventure game engine, the Adventure Game Interpreter, or AGI. King's Quest 1 was built on it, and thanks to that foresight, Sierra spent less time porting the game to other platforms. They also got a stroke of good fortune. Soon after the game's release, Tandy happened to develop an IBM PC compatible platform that did take off, and now that the game could run on lots of popular platforms, sales of King's Quest soared. AGI was the engine used for the next several King's Quest games, but also Space Quest, Police Quest, and others. It made it much faster to develop and distribute, and much easier for those games to sell well. The engine also contributed to the series' similar look and feel. With their production pipeline humming, Sierra was able to crank out hit after hit in the 80s. That was sometimes in spite of the text engine interface. The UX of typing in commands was a weak link in the design of adventure games. On its surface, it seems like a very freeform way to interact with a game. Just type whatever it is you want to happen. But in practice, players were very often frustrated with just how limiting the text parser was. Misspell anything, use a synonym, describe an object wrong, or try to do anything outside of a very rigid set of verbs, nouns, and tasks, and the game would screech to a halt. There had to be a better way. The mid-80s started to see some games get away from the text parser, and Japan led the way. Planet Mephius, created by Japanese developer Eiji Yokoyama, had allowed limited mouse controls and a command menu system in addition to the traditional text control. Ports of other adventure games on the NES basically had to use a cursor system to work nicely with a controller. But it was LucasArts who would bring the point-and-click adventure to a much wider audience. LucasArts was already a well-funded branch of Lucasfilm when they decided to dip their toes into the graphical adventure game market. They had already made a text-parsing adventure game in an adaptation of the movie Labyrinth. But in 1987, Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick designed their first point-and-click adventure game, Maniac Mansion. To help make it, they created an adventure game engine of their own, the Scum Engine. From a technical perspective, the Scum Engine fixed many of the same problems that Sierra's game engines were fixing. Separating game concepts from the engine allowed them to both quickly iterate on characters, game scenarios, and the game script, while also letting the programmers more easily port the game to Amiga, Macs, DOS, Windows, and others. The Scum engine let LucasArts iterate very quickly, and they would crank out many successful games over the next several years. Maniac Mansion would spawn a sequel, Day of the Tentacle. The Monkey Island series became very popular, Thanks to being under the umbrella of Lucasfilm, they made several fantastic Indiana Jones adventure games. Ron Gilbert would also start Humongous Entertainment, which licensed the Scum Engine and would use it to make even more popular adventure games geared towards kids. But LucasArts wasn't just putting out the same type of adventure games as everyone else. There was a distinct design sensibility to their games. Ron Gilbert wanted to fix many of the shortcomings he saw in the standard adventure game design of the time. He hated typing out commands and designed the games to be fully point-and-click, showing all the actions the game allowed, and letting players click on objects to interact with them. LucasArts' puzzle design was not as obtuse as Sierra's on average, with clear goals and sub-goals, and with solutions that seemed obvious in retrospect instead of arbitrary. They avoided having players find dead ends, deaths, or other unfixable states a player could wind up in. The King's Quest series had been infamous for having unsolvable puzzles caused by something the player had done or forgotten to do hours before. LucasArts games also tried to avoid strict, real-time, timer-based puzzles. Players could more often think through problems at their own pace, and the tone of LucasArts games generally leaned towards slapstick comedy, which, thanks to some great writers, they nailed in game after game. Both Sierra and LucasArts had settled into their niches, and cranked out hits one after another. Sierra made four King's Quest games, two Space Quests, a Police Quest, a Leisure Suit Larry, and a half dozen other games on AGI in a span of six years. Then they made an update to their engine, called SCI, and made all of these. Yep. Still going. They made a lot. In one decade. LucasArts made Maniac Mansion and its sequel, Day of the Tentacle, three Monkey Island games, 
Zack McCracken, two Indiana Jones games, Loom, Sam and Max, The Dig, and Full Throttle on Scum at roughly the same time. The engines that let Sierra and LucasArts release so many games so quickly were only letting them make games with very similar core designs. Sierra games running on AGI and SGI largely had similar looks and feels. Same with Scum Engine games, and the shortcomings of the genre were becoming more apparent. There was still a lot of pixel hunting. The games sometimes suffered from a lack of direction. Inventory puzzles could still be nonsense and devolve into rubbing two items together randomly until they stuck. Even just the march of time with year after year of largely similar games were taking their toll. The formula was getting stale. While Sierra and LucasArts were humming along at the top, there was a little studio and a big technological advancement that were about to blow the adventure game market wide open. The year is 1993. Up until now, games were severely limited in size. Games came in bundles of 3.5 inch floppy disks that each held only about a megabyte and a half of data. But that was about to change. CD-ROM drives were just now becoming mainstream, and with them you could fit 700 megabytes on a single disk. You could now cram tons of photorealistic graphics and real recorded audio in your game. And that's just what a small developer named Cyan did. They took inspiration from Jules Verne's novel The Mysterious Island and made a fully rendered 3D adventure game called Myst. It was a calm, serene design, an adventure game geared towards adults, featuring a completely minimalistic UI and an anonymous main character that was designed to be a stand-in for the player. Players could get lost for hours in the game's surreal, dreamlike landscapes, filled with puzzles without time pressure, and just like LucasArts games, no real way to fall into a fail state. Myst and other early CD games looked leaps and bounds better than their competition, and Myst became a blockbuster hit, a game that reached a much broader audience than the standard computer games of the day. Yeah, under the surface, the games were still point-and-click interactions and puzzles whose answers kinda sorta barely made sense. But look at how good this game looks! Yes, I know it's not great now, get in the 1993 mindset, come on. The CD-ROM had its killer app. Sales were unbelievable. Myst became the greatest selling PC game to that point, a crown it would hold for 7 years and only give up to The Sims. Suddenly, the 3D rendered graphical adventure was extremely in vogue. The smash success of Myst opened up publishers' wallets to fund the development of an exploding number of other adventure games. Some borrowed from the grittier, more mature, minimalistic, and more immersive feel of Myst. Others borrowed from the cartoonier, comedic feel of LucasArts. There were lots of FMV games, like the Tex Murphy series and Toonstruck, starring Christopher Lloyd for some reason. But there were a lot of games clearly made to chase trends too. Even Sierra wasn't immune to the draw towards a darker, grittier adventure game. They released Gabriel Knight, which was pretty good, and Phantasmagoria, which... wasn't. Though it did sell very well. Myst was even popular enough for someone to pay John Goodman to star in a direct parody game, Pissed. Hello there! I'm King Mattress, ruler of Pissed, and I know who you are. Yeah, this was on every computer store shelf in 1996. With so many adventure games coming out in such a short time, it's surprising how static the core design was. The engines that helped Sierra and LucasArts make games very quickly did so by allowing them to put new scenery and objects over the same mechanics game after game. So adventure games stayed what they were. Sierra and LucasArts built empires on that design, so why rock the boat? But the competition was catching up fast. Bit by bit, other genres were putting in their own cutting-edge graphics and complex storytelling. This was the era of Half-Life, Diablo, and Starcraft, of Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil, and Ocarina of Time. Adventure games couldn't stand alone as the best the medium had to offer anymore, and the public interest started to drift away. The flaws in the games were more apparent, and the gameplay was so static that the entire genre was practically defined by its mechanics. The perspective and framing of the story, the point-and-click gameplay, the obtuse puzzles, the pixel hunting, none of it was aging well. The genre was about to collapse. By 1998, even Grim Fandango, Perhaps LucasArts' greatest critical success and finest adventure game title overall sold terribly. The people that had in years past bought King's Quest, Monkey Island, and Myst 
could now buy lots of high-quality first-person shooters, strategy games, RPGs, and action-adventure games. The years of stagnation in the point-and-click gameplay design, and the competition from other games in the graphics and storytelling departments, sapped much of the drawing power of what had made the genre so popular in the first place. The adventure games being made at the end of the 90s weren't bad games, of course, they just weren't groundbreaking anymore. Plus, the increase in art resources that top-tier adventure games now demanded made each game much more expensive to make. Publishers saw sales take a dip, and became very skittish about funding new adventure games. The last few that were in development were allowed to finish, but they didn't fare much better than Grim Fandango. Publishers looking forward could reasonably project sales to continue to be low, so it didn't make much sense to allocate enough money to make a big budget adventure game. They could use that money to fund a game in another more popular genre instead. Sequels to Sam and Max in full throttle were cancelled. Without the budget to make a new top tier 3D adventure game, the flow of new ones slowed to a crawl until they practically disappeared. The public perception of decline fed on itself, and the adventure game was cemented as a dead genre. But was it? Next time on Design Doc, Modern Adventure Games. Japanese adventure games keep rolling, Kickstarter funds a wave of throwbacks, the meteoric rise and fall of Telltale, and indies make the genre go supernova.